Hey folks, how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at a really cool operator that I don't see a lot of people using to its full potential, and that is the error dat. Now the error dat is really interesting because what it does is it accumulates any of the errors and warnings happening on any operator in the project and brings them into one table with all of the relevant information you need. Now there's a bunch of different situations where this can be extremely, extremely useful. But before we get into that, let's actually set up an error dat because it has a lot of interesting settings that you can get to work with. So the first thing I want to do here in my blank project is create an error dat. Now by default, it's going to be empty and you're not going to see anything happening inside of it because we don't really have any errors inside of this blank project. So let me go and start to generate a few errors on purpose and let's see what happens inside of our error dat. Now one of the great things about this is that it's, you know, comprehensive. It doesn't matter if it's a top error, a Python script error, you know, some kind of weird error trying to load a file, maybe a warning that a connection was lost with a server, you know, maybe if you're using something like TCP IP dat or WebSockets or any of these kind of things, any kind of error that would be visible in touch becomes visible inside of our error dat. So an easy example that I can create here is let me make a movie file in top. And by default, we have our movie loading OK. But if I go and purposefully make the file path wrong by just typing one, two, three at the end of it, all of a sudden we can see a bunch of errors inside of our error dat. We can see the source of it, which is telling us which operator it's coming from the actual message of the error. And this is really nice because this will match the exact same error that you would actually see if you middle click. So you actually get the full error message of it. You can also see that we get the absolute frame at which this happened inside of the project, what relative frame on the timeline, which may or may not be useful for you, the severity of it, which we'll talk about in a second, and the type of the operator that is having that error. Now you can see it's really interesting that it gives you so much detail. So for example, this error that it's giving us now is telling us that there's actually a parameter error, a syntax error in our Python expression because I put one, two, three after the string. But we can see if I remove that and put that inside of the string here. So now it's no longer a Python error, but instead a warning that it failed to open the file, I can actually see a completely different set of messages. I can still see it's the same operator, but now the message specifically tells me it failed to open file. And we can see all of the other elements here are mostly the same except for the severity, which is now set to warning. So if you ever had seen the yellow kind of exclamation point, that's a warning message. And the red ones are usually severe abort messages. Now, we can see this, you know, we can continue to make examples here. I think a quick one that's nice is to see that, you know, even Python errors inside of scripts can be detected in here. So for example, if I create a fake script here that will error just by trying to print a key from a dictionary that doesn't exist, you know, on that op, I'd get all of this script error. And we can see inside of the error dat, I have all of that information. It tells me project one slash text one, and it gives me the full message inside of that single line, which is a little bit tough to read since it's, it's a single line now. And it tells us that it's an abort level of error. So it's something really ran wrong inside of this error. Now, the error dat itself has a lot of really useful features. Um, first of all, the ability to filter between the different kinds of sources of errors, types of errors, severities of errors, and even the actual messages that are coming back. Now, for a lot of the time, what I would recommend when using the error dat is I find setting the source is the most important thing that I like to set on the actual dat parameters itself. And then any of the other filtering, I often find it's much easier to do inside of the callbacks in Python. So a good example of how this source works is let me create a container here. And inside of that, I'm going to make a composite top, which I know when it doesn't have two inputs, it will automatically throw an error that says not enough sources specified. And if I go back to my error dat, I can see that that error is also logged in there. Now the source allows us to put a path into this parameter and tell touch designer only look at errors coming from this area of the network. 
And this is really helpful for a few reasons. One of them is that there is actually a whole hidden area of touch designer, which is kind of the hidden system area with lots of operators and processes. And sometimes there can be errors and warning inside of there that we don't particularly want. And in a lot of cases, you may actually only need the error data to watch a sensitive part of your network, because just like anything else in touch designer, you know, the more operators this is watching for errors and the more errors and warnings that are flowing through it, obviously it's going to take a little bit more of a performance toll. So in some sense, right now we can see that this air dat is watching the whole project and that's because it has the star in it, the asterisk. And what I could do is clear my output here and hit the log current errors. And what this will do is go through the project in its current state and get any error or warning it sees. And you can see when I clicked on that, all of a sudden I have slash sys slash local slash user shortcuts has an error slash sys slash devices slash midi slash chaos, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's some errors elsewhere in the touch designer application that aren't really specific to our project. So most of the time I find what I'll do is if I have a container that's holding all of the elements of the project, if I just wanted to watch my operators, I could do something like type forward slash project one in the source. Then what I can do is hit clear to clear it out and then log again. And now we can see that I have all three of the errors. I have the error inside of the <clears throat> container comps composite. I have my text here and my movie file right there. Now, with that said, you may also want to be even more specific. So for example, if you're making a heartbeat system or a system that's communicating with another application or computer, maybe that needs a little bit more monitoring than just your general kind of, you know, generative art or kind of video playback project. And you can even further set the source of this. So let's say inside of this container is the only place I want to monitor for errors. I could go ahead and even say, you know what, not only go into slash project one, but it has to be in container one or below. And you'll see if I clear this out and log the current errors, now only the composite inside of the container is getting logged inside of my error data. So that's a really great feature that I like to just set right from the get go. You know, where do I actually want to be watching for my errors? Do I want to watch my whole project? Do I want to watch a specific area that, you know, maybe has some user inputs that, that might need you know, fixing, tweaking or protecting against? Um, so that's the first thing I'll set. In this case, I'm just going to set it to project one. So it gets all of my errors but also ignores all of the forward slash sys errors. Now from here, inside of the actual callbacks is where a lot of the meat and potatoes functionality is going to get added. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this up here and we can see that there's a really simple single function callback that we have called on error. So whenever an error is caught, it's going to trigger this function and you can see it gives us a lot of data. So all of the same kind of data that we had inside of this table it's actually just gonna give us immediately inside of our Python function. Now, like I said, this kind of work is so useful in so many different situations. You know, whether you're talking about a permanent installation, short-term installation, um, even just content creation, you know, whether you're trying to build logs, you know, for an installation, whether it's a permanent installation and, and maybe you have an SLA signed for service and you have to make sure that it's, online and working for most of the time, being able to get email messages or SMS notifications whenever an error is detected, that could be built into here. You could even build in safety mechanisms. For example, one of the things that I find happens a lot of the time is when you set up a client with a CMS and they're able to access the source materials like add new movies or images or any other kind of data files into uh, your project, a lot of the time you try and be as strict as possible with what they could be doing or could be adding. You know, you always try and tell them the best specifications for codecs, but invariably something could go wrong. And the last thing you want is for all of your screens to go black because somebody put a, you know, a ProRes movie or some kind of weird codec of movie that doesn't work inside of your project. So even as a quick example here, I thought it would be fun to set up a callback inside of our error dat that if a movie ever fails to load it will automatically override that and put in a temporary piece of content instead 
And this is something simple that can be really effective on any kind of installation where maybe there's a CMS or users inputting movies. So in that case, what I can do is start to think to myself, okay, well, how can I filter for this kind of error? Now, there's a lot of different ways we can do it. And we have so many different options, which is a good thing in this case. So what I could do is firstly, I could check the source and I could see is movie file in, in the name of the source. I could also check the source because in this case, what's really nice about this callback is the source is not just a string path, but it's actually the operator class. It's the operator object itself. So I could check what type of operator it is to see if it's a movie file in top. Or what we could do is also check this message and see, does the message say fail to open file? You know, because that's going to be very specific to actually opening a file. And I can even do both if I want. So let's go in here and let's say, let's start a simple if statement and let's start with if the message equals, and we know that message is going to say fail to open file. And we can say if the source.name, and actually what we'll do in this case is we'll say if movie file in is in the source's name, then we can say, okay, well now what do we want to do? Well, first of all, if we know that someone has tried to load a file and it failed to load, I want to override this file parameter. So what I could do is say op, movie file in, or actually in this case, no, we want to be dynamic. So what we'll do is we'll say the source, because that's actually going to tell us who the operator is here that had the error, dot par, dot file equals. And in this case, what I'll do is maybe grab a simple nature clip here. And I will copy that path so that I can use that as my, you know, temp asset in case of failure. So I'm going to set the source parameter, the source's operator, the source operator's file parameter to be that nature asset. And then I'm going to force it to reload that asset. So I can say source dot par dot reload pulse dot pulse. So that way, if a movie file in ever fails to open a file, I'm going to go in automatically, overwrite it with an existing asset that I know exists, and I'm going to reload that asset. So I'll save that and we can see this in action. So right now I have, uh, actually let's switch the asset first. Let's go over to something else that works, maybe count.mov. But then let's say a client comes along and tries to load count123.mov. Automatically, that error was caught by the error dat. My script was executed and the file was overwritten just as I told it to and then it reloaded it instantly without really any situation happening. So while this is a really simple example, I think this kind of thought process is really what'll help you set kind of your work and your practice apart from, you know, a lot of folks that maybe could be just starting out or are in the earlier parts of their career, because when it comes to permanent installations, I'll tell you, the client never wants to see the screen black. And the more ways that you can help protect that system, that content from any kind of user inputs, um, especially, you know, we're talking about assets here, but this could also apply to things like API data coming in, being able to catch if certain uh, scripts are failing to run because the data may be changed and whether it's notifying you or whether it's switching to a backup set of data that it does know works and is functioning. All of these things really help set your work above the rest. Enjoy. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.